Welcome to the Dashboard Effect Podcast. I'm Brick Thompson. I'm Caleb Oaks. Hey, Caleb. It's been a couple weeks since we were in the studio recording, and I thought today we might talk about data pipelines. Kind of nerdy, but if you're listening to this, you probably don't mind. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, data pipelines are the way you move data from a transactional system, like your ERP, your CRM, into your data lake so that you can start doing things with that, you know data scientist stuff and BI and reporting and various things. Mm -hmm. Um, You can almost think of it like a set of plumbing, you know, a series of pipes. And how do you have that flow smoothly and not clog and not run slow and that type of thing? So your team builds these all day long. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I thought we might talk about, like, what are some of the considerations? And I know we could start, like, from the very beginning when you're thinking about building a data pipeline and you're looking at a, a API or a direct SQL connection, how do you decide what you're going to pull over? Some people might think you automatically should just pull everything, but I'm going to guess that's not optimal usually. Yeah, I mean, it could, like so many answers in IT, it depends. depends, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, I think the for our particular use case, when you're looking at doing analytics and you know, you're, you're usually setting out with some sort of goal in mind, right? Um, you want to start with the tables that are going to tables and columns and objects or whatever it is to, that are going to get you closest to being able to do that. Um, now, it's it's always better to have more than to have less. So, um, you know, when we when we pull data from like databases, it's a lot easier to pull a lot of data and exclude what we don't need. The opposite is true for APIs, right? Because they're just labor intensive to pull. Yeah, they're labor intensive. There's different. It's just different. It's kind of a whole different beast, right? Um, So you, yeah, I mean, it's better to to look at all right, what endpoints do we need to pull and focus in on those. Um, API endpoints can work very different for the same system depending on the endpoint, right? So Mm -hmm. you want to you want to make sure that you're you're making good use of your time when you're pulling from an API. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's to answer your question. I mean, you, you pull as much as you feasibly can um, from a database. Yeah. Be pick and choose from an API. Okay, interesting. So you're sort of just thinking about the ROI. What what do I absolutely have to have to meet the reporting needs or whatever I'm doing with it? Mm-hmm. Um, and then if it's easy to pull, pull more. Yep. And if it's not, you know, maybe print it to that. Yeah, exactly, right. That makes sense. Yeah, and you can, you can always go back later, right? I mean, that's what we do with our APIs is we'll pull whatever we think is most important um, and is going to, you know, satisfy the requirement at the time. Um, and then when new things come up, we'll go ahead and build that endpoint out and pull that data through. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I almost want to dive into the the technology behind sort of doing those API things, but I think it's probably beyond what we have time for today. (laughs) How how do you handle transforms on the way to a data lake? So, you know, in in the old world, you did ETLs, extract, transform, load. Um, You were loading to database tables and views and so on. Um, is 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 there an analogous way to think about what you're doing as you're pulling stuff into a data lake? Yeah, so it's a, it's a good question because it's kind of a um, – I think this is something that's a little bit misunderstood. So we – the way the best way to do this with the technologies nowadays is to not do any transformations, you right? You do them you, after, yeah. Yeah, you just pull your – just push the data into, into your lake as raw as possible, like just raw data. Um, and then from there, the best thing to do, especially if you're getting started, is to like start – analyzing the data, looking at it, maybe building some POCs for people, some draft reports, stuff like that. A lot of times you can do 90% of what you need to um, from the raw data, just using like SQL views on top of it. Like almost, what's a, there's like a technical phrase for it, whatever the technical phrase for it is. Basically what I'm trying to say is like you, uh, you're just querying the raw data sure. and shaping it without actually storing the result, right? Yeah, yeah. You're just loading that rectally into Power BI in our case, right? You're yep. just directly loading it there. So you're creating maybe a serverless SQL view if you're on Azure Data Lake. Mm-hmm. Um, you're not moving the data. You're not storing it in a different form. Yep. You're just using that view to pump it into your reporting system. Yeah, exactly. And what I think that's, that's sometimes misunderstood is that there are tools out there like 
um, the one that's coming to mind is Alteryx, that you have a ton of um, options in what I would term as like your data pipeline, like when you're moving data to do things with right. it. Right, so you can join it to like an Excel file, you can do all kinds of different stuff, and they make it super easy, like I'll drag and drop, and then it just drops a new file out somewhere, and then you're ready for analysis, and um, I just, that's just not a good thing it's to old, do. It's an old yeah. model. It would yeah. be better to get, let's say that, that you're joining to an Excel file, it would be better just to load your Excel file to your lake, and then do that join in a serverless view, rather than in a pipeline. Yeah, right? yeah. It's much better that way. Yeah, makes sense. How do you handle failures, pipeline failures? So you get a, a business critical thing, like we have a customer that has feedlots and they need their data first thing in the morning to do certain things. Mm -hmm. um, it's business critical. If they don't have it, they can't do those things. Um, how do you make sure, first of all, that your pipelines are robust? How do you, how do you deal with having them fail in a way that doesn't create a mess? Um, how do you deal with making sure you know when one has failed so an operator can go fix it? What, what are some considerations there? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good, it's another good consideration. So there's, you know, there's a, a couple things. I mean, ideally, like in this, the example that you were kind of alluding to, um, that was built in a really solid way. So the, the business critical stuff is kind of segregated from other things. So there are some up, upstream dependencies, um, but it's not the entire pipeline. So, like, mm. we only need a portion of the overall ecosystem to succeed, and that's pretty stable, in order for that business critical stuff to be ready, right? Um, now, there's a bunch of other things that go on that have a lot more uh, probability of failure. Um so if you if you can segregate things like that, that's always a good idea, right? Especially if there's something that's business critical. Um, if you're just you know if you're just doing data analytics and you and you have some reports out, uh, and let's say they're not that business critical, um, letting it fail and stopping the process basically at that point, like as soon as you see a failure, like have your pipelines stop. Um, there are some exceptions to that. This is where we could get really technical um but you know if there's anything you don't want your the rest of your pipeline to run if there's a failure right you just want to stop it uh and then from that place you want to send a send an alert uh out to whoever needs to see it uh that can go in and then and address it right uh, okay um, so you don't have automatic rollback of stuff that came in before it failed that type of thing if you've built your your pipelines well you shouldn't need that right okay. like each chunk should be like its own deal so so for example let's say that you're loading sales and customers and items you wouldn't load your customers or like load yeah load your customers all the way through to the end and then go load your transactions or your sales all the way through to the end then go load your items all the way through to the end you would load all three all three customers sales items first step just load them right okay and let's say you got another step after that um then you would do your next step. Let's say that you do have some transformations after you load it. Um, then you would do all three or whatever those transformations are at that point. Then you then you end right. So if one of those fails, one of those steps, then you just stop. Okay. Right? So you you may be a worst case scenario. You may have customers I'm loaded yeah. and part of your sales, but no items. That's much better. I mean, and I'm, I'm talking continuing like on, then yeah. continuing on and having like blank items and blank customers yeah. and partial sales for a day or whatever. Yeah. Um, you would rather have stale data than wrong data, right? Okay. So the operator, if you set it up right, can go in and get rid of anything that was partial before they kick it off again. Yeah. Well, I mean, honestly, if you've built your pipeline well, you should just be able to rerun it. Doesn't and it'll, matter. It'll wipe out whatever yeah. was there. And, you know, you should be doing this gets into like delta loads and stuff, and you should never be... There are some exceptions to this, but most of the time you should never do like a trunk and reload of the entire data set. You should, if even if you're loading the entire data set, it should go into like a staging mm -hmm. then you should merge it with the rest of it. So you've got like a stable layer of data. Yeah. And so anything that's coming across new doesn't impact like what's already there. Yeah. You know what I mean? That makes sense. I do know what you mean. Another question I thought of was around scalability. So, um, I would imagine you've got to have some kind of monitoring of how's this performing, right? Because if you have a pipeline that, let's say it kicks off every morning at two in the morning, and when you built it, there was only 
so much data and it could run in an hour. You weren't worried about it. You didn't need it till six, six the next morning. But over time, there's been a lot more data added to it. Now it's running slower. It, you know, might get to it took six hours to run, which may not be acceptable. How do, how do you keep an eye on that? And, and then what do you do about it if you run into that? Yeah, I think at least in our world, most of the time we have a pretty good idea of what um, the load's going to be. So like if a full load, meaning we're loading all, every single record from every table that we're pulling, um, takes an ex- exceptionally long time, um, then that might be something that we're worried about. Typically, with the technologies nowadays, you can do a full load like pretty quick. Okay. Um, and then from there, you really should be doing like delta loads, uh, meaning only new and changed records. Um, in some cases, you might stick with a full load if it's actually really fast. Um, but you know, you're gonna. The best thing to do is just use the out of the box tools. Like so, we use Azure um, and Synapse, and those are there's monitoring tools in there um, to make sure that th- that things are continue to run the way that you would expect them to. Uh, but I think the biggest thing for that is to um, make sure you've got good delta loading set up. Yeah, you know, okay, so you, you're not pulling you everything. Yeah, because you're, you're not going to see a company go from having 20,000 sales records a day to 500,000. Like that. Right. I mean, I guess maybe well. you could, but <laughs> you would know something's happening yeah. and like that would be a Deal trigger. Be like, okay, we got to look at this. Um, if we're going to grow that big, right? yeah. you probably got other problems. You may not even want to look at those reports anymore. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to guess, too, that a lot of times, especially if you're using an API endpoint, you're, um, the throttle is how fast the API will mm-hmm. respond. So there's nothing really to scale. You you just need that to respond. I'm guessing the receiving system mm-hmm. can take it at, you know, about as fast as the API will give it to you. That's actually a really good point. That usually is the bottleneck, is the source feeding the data it's not ingesting it like you can ingest data into azure into your data lake that extru- ridiculous like, ridiculous speeds, speeds yeah. if you can feed it to it that fast right yeah so that's typically your your uh your bottleneck but it's still something to that you need to be aware of right yeah okay um we're almost out of time quickly common pitfalls that, like what what are the common things that go wrong when someone builds a pipeline that they didn't do right yeah i mean so i've seen a couple interesting things one that we already touched on a little bit like the alteryx type uh scenario that's pretty common um there's also if you think about the if you just wrap your head around like how data moves um you know if you don't if you can move it as little as you possibly can so um, one example would be if you can do some joins and stuff inside of like a serverless SQL, that data stays there. And then let's say you just need to store that result somewhere. So do everything in serverless SQL, store the result. One thing that I've seen people do before is when they need to store a result like that, they'll pull it out. They'll do like lookups and things like that. And another technology, there's actually one in Synapse um, called data flows. And you, then you're looking up back to the, the source. So you've actually oh. pulled, let's say you've got 100,000 rows, you've pulled all your 100,000 rows into a different technology now, it's running on Spark or something. Then, you know, Spark goes out and grabs another set of data, goes to another set of data. So that time pulling the data out into Spark, then putting it back in, yeah, so it slows everything down. So um, skip that. Just use a, a serverless view. Yeah, in most cases, skip okay. that. Now, the exception would be if you have like hundreds of millions of rows and you need to do some big time stuff on it spark is going to do that faster than your serverless sql will um but those are a couple couple common things that uh you know to keep in mind the other is just uh just over complicating the pipeline Hmm. right or making a making a so one of the things that we do and which i really like is we have for each loops and a lot of our stuff so We'll have like it's like metadata driven pipeline so you'll have like here's everything that the pipeline needs to accomplish and here's the commands that needs to run then it for each just for each is through so our pipelines are really simple it's like start for each loop do something else end right yeah um what i've seen before is like you'll have a hundred pipelines and every pipeline is moving one it's like source table to destination table, mm-hmm. source table to destination table, and you just end up with a mess of stuff. Yeah. Um, and then you also end up with like crazy logs. It's just not the, not the best way to do it. It's one way to do it, but it's going to take you way longer to build that. 
Um, if you need to make a change somewhere to add like your delta logic or something, you then yeah. got to go to a bunch of different pipelines to do it. Um, anyway, I guess all that's right, probably good that's for good. Now. I, I was going to ask you if, if a company could do one thing to improve their pipelines. I'm guessing your answer is simplify. Yeah, simplify. I mean, if you if you've got joins and stuff in your pipelines, get rid of them. Put them into a, into a, like a SQL statement or something, um, or into like a you know some, somewhere that they're not in your pipeline directly. Um, and then I think if you can, the more metadata driven you can make your pipelines, the better. Oh, okay. Anything to add on that? <laughs> yeah, it sounds yeah. like that's a that's a deep one there. Yeah, that, yeah I mean, it's it's basically like. Uh, having a a set of data that controls your pipeline so that you have variables in your pipeline that you're feeding from your metadata so you have a standardized call. approach to how you're doing yeah. standardized approach right. yeah exactly that's a very that's Got very it. important um yeah it's just it makes your life a lot easier cool that's awesome I, I love the stuff your team does yeah it's good stuff all right good to uh geek out with you here a little bit <laughs> for sure all right talk to you next time If you enjoyed this video and found it helpful, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. We'd be grateful. You can visit our website at bluemargin.com for more insights and resources. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next episode.